Now I'm very, very happy to introduce uh, Yuka Pekka Haikila and uh, Will Scott, uh, as you see here, um, who will be speaking about modern life in North Korea and how it is uh, for youth, for example, to live in Pyongyang. And they will introduce themselves, so I will just hand over the stage to you and wish you a good talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Warmly, warmly welcome, also on my behalf, to the talk about observations on the societal and technological changes in the DPRK. My name is Jukka Pekka Heikkilä. I, I used to um, work in North Korea. Now I'm an Academy of Finland fellow and visiting scholar in Stanford. And uh, this is a co-hosted talk. And with... I'm Will. Hi. Yeah, and um, a few words before we get going on what's going on in North Korea in both terms in society and tech. Um, so what is the experience that we are speaking from? Um, I used to go to Pyongyang between 2000 and 2017, um, up as much as up uh, six months per year. Um, I've, I've been teaching management, international business, international management, the first courses in the country, um, done a couple of startup events and lectured also um, outside the university. And Will? Uh, I, excuse me. Uh, I was uh, teaching computer science uh, 2013, 14, 15. Uh, talked about that here at CCC. Uh, so thinking more about the technical side of things. Yeah, so there were a couple of talks actually on, on the previous yeah, and this, this content is, is brand new, obviously, and the way we are going to do this is that um, first, setting the stage a bit, living in Pyongyang, how it is, what's different, what's similar, then uh, going um, towards observations, how North Koreans in the country perceive Western concepts of entrepreneurship and, and also the economy itself. And then it's up to Will, we switch the decks and uh, see about a bit of tech. And then we have time surely for any type of, of Q&A. Sounds good? Okay, let's get going. Um, this is the most uh, common question um, you usually get when you talk about North Korea. How did you end up there? How did you will end up there? I cold emailed the school. I did the same. Um, how did you cold email? Like, how did it... I sent an email to HR at Poost.kp after seeing a uh, YouTube video of someone who was looking for computer science professors at the school. Um, and they managed to get back to me. One of the other professors was based in Portland, Oregon. And so I drove down and got coffee with him and convinced myself that it wasn't completely crazy, uh, and went from there. And in, in my case, I was doing, um, on the side of, of my PhD in China, I was doing an MA on, on political science with a master thesis on North Korea. And I found this, also the, the, the address, Gmail address, and emailed, and got a reply that um, your PhD expertise on international management is interesting, and that uh, we just want to make sure that it's voluntary work. And but you're welcome to come. Six months went by, the school was just established. And, um, and then off I went the uh, first time 2012. And the way, the way it's done, um, you arrive to Pyongyang, your passport is, is requested to give to the uh, authorities, and then next day you teach. And that's, um, that's how it, it it started, and so basically our home was um, the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology campus. And you, uh, you live there, and if you, if you wish to go outside the campus, you always uh, request uh, permission to do something. Um, what were the things we did? On go to restaurants, see museums, go hiking. Yeah. And go to play pool. Yeah. And um, so basically, but you always inform it in advance. You, you, you respect the local environment 
and play, play according to those rules. The school itself um, has 600 students, used to be all male, uh, not anymore. Um, and it's, um, there are three departments, which is um, uh, international finance, international management and finance, then agriculture and life sciences, then electronic computer engineering. And uh, the, the management department is the only Western based department in the country. And um, what else on the school? Do you guys speak any Korean? No, uh, sorry, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so all teaching is done in English. So students are graduates, often from uh, the most prestigious universities or sometimes from the countryside. And then they, um, uh, they apply to the university. First they study English, then they specialize. And end of their studies, um, they attended courses like international management. Um, so to answer your question, uh, no. Uh, I, I took yes, uh, no, one semester crash course in Korean uh, before I went uh, in the summer. And from that when I'm able to pronounce the phonetic alphabet, uh, words that are loan words from Chinese I can understand. I can say simple phrases like I want to go to a restaurant, but uh, I'm not going to have a real conversation. And, um, and basically, the daily life went on that um, you were teaching either on the mornings and afternoons. And then what's very unique in the university setting is that um, it's a very rare place, or maybe the, on the only ones, where you can really interact with the locals, is especially the lunch and dinners. They're always um, uh, very interesting uh, venues for discussions. And. Um, this, uh, there were a couple of short videos. This is before the lunch. Um, exercises which some attend, some don't. And is there a sound? Yeah. So, um, as you could see, what's different, what's similar? Different is that um, it is, um, imagine students in Germany of, of marching in the campus, no. It's, that's very different, that it's very disciplined. What's similar is, um, for example, the content that I teach and communicated, and it was exactly similar than um, I would teach in all the university in Finland where I'm based. And uh, of course, the pace would be much slower, especially on ideation. But then again, um, and the content would be a bit adjusted, but nothing was ever censored. So that was um, uh, what was allowed to teach. And bearing in mind that entrepreneurship itself is illegal in, in by law. And so yet um, the first course happened uh, 2014. And this tells a lot about the atmosphere. So now when we are getting into the uh, mindset and about the perceptions on, on the economy and the social change. Um, the atmosphere in the classroom was very warm. And of course, in the beginning, it was very strict. But then um, we started to talk about dreams and ideation for solving the problems in the countryside. And, and it went towards a very open, open and addressing the problems in the country, which was one was recycling company who won. So we had a pitching competition in, after every course where the winner would get a chocolate or a football or something like that. So um, in a way, it always was about ideation, not it um, was, oh, now the font is. And then 2015, it was a healthy fast food. What I mean by healthy was that students got often sick on the street food. So they, they wanted to industrialize the, the street food. And so basically, again, addressing what's going on in the economy, in the society, and how to improve that. And it solved the, um, that people are more and more busy. So same issues apply in Pyongyang than here. Like people have same worries, love, time, money, and uh, very, very common problems. And what happened in, in this was um, um, there was a very interesting marketing strategy. So we often engage in discussions that um, how do you do marketing in an officially socialist setting? Well, you need to work your ways out 
through what is allowed, what is not. It was that um, uh, the group wanted to develop a rumor-based system where they would acknowledge that the chefs in their venture uh, would have blood type B. Why they would say anything like that, that we have blood type B chefs? Because the common folklore goes that blood type B women are good chefs. However, everyone knows that it's a false, but yet you could spread that kind of rumor. So they really played what is real, what is assumption. And, um, and so it was always kind of localized addressing the local environment. And then um, 2016, there was a Pyongyang Startup Week, um, which um, you can see this is rather symbolic, symbolic picture. And, um, and there we had a um, prizes again where footballs, and I had a team of, of six professors with me. And now we are going to see a short video of what happened. Let's start from... North Korea isn't known for its vibrant culture of entrepreneurship, but these would-be businessmen are hoping that Monday it might be. This is Startup Week in Pyongyang. There are, of course, neither startups nor investors, but there is enthusiasm. Western business school professors have flown in to teach for a week at Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, the country's only private foreign-funded university. The participants are being mentored on how to write a business pitch and put together a PowerPoint presentation. Instead of real products, they're using modeling clay to make props. An innovative business remains a long way off. The country's Stalinist economic system means real startups with real investors will have to wait. But the excitement of possibility pervades the auditorium as the make-believe businesses make real investor pitches. One startup sells chemical and radioactive protection gear made out of crab and shrimp shells. The winning team presents a plausible sounding recycling venture. Startup week is a dry run for the real thing, though no one knows when or if that will ever happen. Charles Clover, Financial Times. So, um... Going back to this, what was also mentioned in the video, model, modeling clay. Um, first of all, taking modeling clay through the customs of China and customs of DPRK, um, when they resemble ex explosive, I'm very happy that they made it to the country. Um, and then um, what was really surprising was when you bring out a playful element, when it's a sensitive topic, um, humor and play uh, quite often weighs out in, in to a safety and, and for example this is um, this particular is um, a building that is used to cure mental issues mental illnesses um, by acknowledging that people might have those is is already um, a great achievement and then uh, uh, adding a bit of playful element into it and it was good good fun and um, there is more like if you want to read um, we just published a uh, Earlier this year, an article about it, and it's um, it's it should be. It's not behind a paywall, no. And then uh, there is a after article. Um, going towards the ending of of, of my slot um, is. So, how is the economic reality based on 2012-2000? I've been there end of 2017 last time, and there are people who have been there in the audience who have been there more recently who can. Um, then engage with the discussion is that um, so um, there is so there are marketplaces that are not um, official but uh, becoming semi-official and being taxed and, and which is kind of hybrid model of socialism and capitalism of course it's not talked about as the term of capitalism and it shouldn't it's, it's a hybrid um, there are chains of policies on, on how to if, but the, the alignment between being an entrepreneur and state-owned enterprise. So it's, it's things are slowly changing there even, although we hear very little about what's going on. And then, as I said earlier, it's, um, of course, keep in mind that, yes, the things we hear about the country, yeah, true, 
surely and and at the same time it's um it is it is a place where there is a lot of fear yet you can see quite a lot of hope you can see that people dream about the future and 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 they dream about love love was always a beautiful topic to discuss it's a, it's also um it brings brings the hope and and then um, discussions often were about the money and the mindset of quite often a common question was hey yuka why does the rest of the world hate us why do the rest of the world make jokes on us then i said well um it's i'm not a politician i shouldn't be talk with politicians politics but um your country might be doing something that the other countries perceive as wrong and fair enough um and but the mindset in 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 the country is that it's victimized that the country has failed that's commonly acknowledged there is no the utopian nation anymore that it's it's the greatest country on the planet but it's the fault of imperialists particularly the US and and it's uh, the northern european like why certain things were clearly um opened allowed to teach and allowed to observe was that the northern european countries seem to be not part of the imperialist uh, click um and the mindset is also on on very eager to um to towards learnings towards new knowledge and and then uh, um what's going on in the economy is 2012 13 they were, they want went that many taxis on the street now there are how many eight companies six 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 taxi companies and so like you see these and traffic jams you see these developing little by little and that um it's now this is from uh, spring chinese company planning to cross sinu choose first for a known special economic zone which basic basically means a massive step towards privatization and also the, already the border areas you can see a lot of change in there and of course western countries can impose as much sanctions as they wish but uh, the studies the research in stanford the research in in princeton best universities have concluded that the sanctions don't work instead they make the misery of the people at the countryside much worse and it's when you look this this is import and export from china and import and export from other countries so you see like how it's 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 going on and these are not reliable stat statistics might be much much more so on on keep that in mind when these type of policies are discussed so what i wanted to bring forward before we land and the discussion is that the country is developing its own isolated infrastructure whether we want it or or not it's it's happening but um with educational enga engagement perhaps not for the persons we were teaching before but for the future gen generation we could bring a bit of of uh, pride the future and now we are going to explore what's the role of tech in this all and this work finished 2017 if you are interested what happened next with actually with you <laughs> how it's um uh, there will be a talk funnily enough next day it's um, um uh, i'm starting at six o'clock about beirut and uh, now it's off to will cool um yeah all right so i'm gonna sort of be giving a somewhat different talk on the tech side of things for the other half hour that we've got or so um and looking specifically at how technology has sort of this arc of what technology as a landscape looks like uh in North Korea um so i'm going to start by talking a little bit about the history of like the last 20 30 years in particular of what these companies and corporate entities look like corporate is maybe a little of a strong statement uh and then what we know about the current state of internal technology uh and and sort of the the line of what international engagement between North Korea and the rest of the world technically looks like um so there were a set of government labs uh or or efforts to begin uh, this current line of computer technology that emerged around 1990 uh both the PIC Pyongyang Informatics Center and KCC the Korea Computing Center 
got established under a three-year plan that happened between 88 and 91. Uh, the, the Pyongyang Informatics Center was sort of the first of these labs. There's a few ex others that have uh, emerged subsequently. Um, you saw that then coincide in the late 90s, there's a big famine and, and sort of this you know, time that we maybe see as really hard for the country. And that meant that there was a really strong drive for entrepreneurial engagement where these corporate entities that had been formed five years earlier are now going out really aggressively to find ways to get foreign money um, and, and sort of trying to get hard cash to support themselves because they don't have the same level of state support that they were maybe have had in the past. The planned economy is falling apart internally. It, you know, it, for individuals' lives, if they can end up working in China or outside of the country, they live a much higher quality of life. And so there's this very sort of scrappy, uh, externally facing view uh, there. And then that international expansion continues through a lot of the 2000s as they realize they can actually make money on this in an ongoing way until sanctions hit in you know, 2012, somewhere around there as nukes sort of wind up and you get a disengagement policy forced on them and they start retreating internally and we, we start to see a lot less of, uh, especially these like big brands that are sort of known uh, externally because they are all targets of sanctions now. Um, so three of the entities that sort of still exist and, and have been the same entities through that whole transition, uh, Kim Il-sung University has a technology program that uh, was sort of where the academics are, but that ends up blurring quite a bit into KCC, the Korea Computer Center. Uh, and then there's the, the Pyongyang Informatics Center that, that's sort of the counterpart, that's the other one that, that has its own set of software. Um, both KCC and PIC you can think of as conglomerate entities. They look a little like Hyundai or one of these big Korean uh, conglomerates in the South or like a family thing that just does a bunch of things in this space. Um, KCC in particular, up until 2005 uh, was chaired. So the, the sort of patron who's managing this whole thing um, is Kim Jong Tech, Kim Song Tech, the, the guy that got assassinated in Malaysia that was like the uh, half brother of, of Kim Jong Un. So, uh, you know, these things are fairly tightly tied in at a sort of top political level of um, top down management. Um, so, Korea Computer Center, uh, we see in uh, the 90s, there's a KCC Europe that, that comes out. Uh, it's one guy in Berlin uh, who thought he could make money outsourcing to Korea. Um, they managed to get something like a million dollars out of him. Um, and with the restriction that he could only run uh, the servers in the DPRK compound in Berlin. So, uh, um, can you speak on? Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, the, um, why is, is this type of activity happening is um, uh, the DPRK embassy system is that all, uh, all the embassies need to be self-sufficient -suffic which means that they need to create their own revenue. So this was an uh, example case on, on So on a that. partnership between KCC and uh, whoever was entrepreneurially minded in the, in the DPRK's German embassy at the time uh, realized they could make money on this. Um, and they, they sold this KCC Europe entity the rights to the .kp top level domain and it managed them from servers in the DPRK embassy compound uh, until that sort of technically got mismanaged uh, near the end of 1999 or something. And then there was a period where KP was offline and then DPRK eventually just sort of reclaimed it and has a different entity running it now. Um, another entity that's KCC affiliated, uh, they sold a game of Go in South Korea. Uh, they also have entities in China, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, and, and sort of a bunch of offices that were doing contract programming that were trying to sell software. Uh, some of those still exist. Um, I think one of the points there is that this is pretty deeply rooted in a top-down management of, and then uh, con combined with a, a bottom-up set of sort of people just sort of going off and trying to make money. We see that continuing now, but with an inward-facing view uh, under the current sanctions regime. So people are now facing on how do they make money against the internal population because that's what they have access to. Um, they're sort of 
I guess that that's the at least legitimate view, which is we see uh, a bunch of a bunch of KCC things of like importing phones for the local thing because they can get hard money for taking a Chinese OEM, buying a load of phones for them, and selling them on the internal market. Um, and, and also, what's what's clearly uh, visible is the development of these internal markets on uh, Pyongyang Trade Fair. Being one example is, is where there are thousands, thousands of people and um, 2013, 14, 15, still there were some uh, foreign companies, but as the sanctions tightened, it went through a domestic and especially on the healthcare. Healthcare and, and health tech, um, a very peculiar uh, phenomenon, North Korea health tech, um, is that it, 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 there was one flaw full of, because the healthcare system has collapsed, country sanctioned, so obviously something gets developed. And, um, and it is one big consumer party, the Pyongyang trade fair, like it's, it's, it's a lot of dollars going, going around. And that's, that's an example of that. Please. Yeah, I, I yeah. guess the, 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 the flip is the, the people who've been externally facing um, because of sanctions and the difficulty of doing a legitimate international business, you're seeing those uh, groups that were maybe perhaps previously a KCC lab doing contract programming now turning to malware or you know hacking Bitcoin or trying to do these sort of crime like things as ways to get money that you know they just sort of ignore the sanctions because they don't need some foreign partner to actually legitimately buy things. Um, these fall within little fiefdoms so a lot of the ministries uh, or top level political things will sponsor internal groups to uh, provide technical things. So um, this is an example of like uh, one set of uh, businesses that I think this one's owned by Ministry of Light Industry that has an associated bank. Uh, the stores would like you to use only the card from that bank to buy things from them. So they just sort of have this whole little top-down world and as you go to different stores that are owned by different ministries you have a different world. Um, each of those ministries would have some software development thing that's like they've got their brand of cell phone as well um, and their tablet that they're importing as their way to make money. It's sort of within their little subset of the family or the country. Okay, so current state of technology. Um, there is hardware that is reasonably easy to acquire. Uh, computers are coming in from China. Phones, mostly what you can buy, at least legitimately, are OEM'd from Chinese companies and then software specifically for North Korea as mandated by the government and then sold. Um, there's been a countrywide emphasis on science and technology for at least since Kim Jong-un, sort of before. Um, a, bit up, a bit before, yeah. So they get a fair amount of leeway and resources and hype, right? And they, they built a bunch of sort of showcase buildings. They're very proud of their electronic libraries and some of these um, evidences of science and technology. Yeah, and um, what's, what's behind this, and also what I discussed, is that there is, a, there is a massive policy change. So it used to be military first, and, and, and all the resources, and partially that's why famine happened, was that the military first poli policy. Now there is a big, big change towards developing um, sustainable economy within the country, and and that's what has happened for the last couple of years, like a really big push on resources for that. Yeah. Um, the, the main area that the government is concerned about and that there's right restrictions is around connectivity. So the ability to communicate with other people. Um, and so uh, here's some examples of modern last couple of years cell phones um, and some of the brands. You had a period where Wi-Fi was just completely disabled. They spent a while where they would try and get the OEMs to not put Wi-Fi chips, to like not populate that chip, and that turned out to be a thing that the OEMs got confused by because they're integrated circuits that have both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, so they would just disable it in hardware. Now they're sort of feeling comfortable enough that they're reintroducing Wi-Fi. Um, they've shown a couple things in the last couple of years that are sort of weird where they're like, we have, this street is now Wi-Fi enabled, but you need to get a SIM card to use the Wi-Fi, which, Sounds like they're doing something pretty funky, um, and um, they haven't. <laughs> comment on comment on, on that funkiness is um, um, in terms of networks, which was the network was uh, provided first first one by uh, Oracom, which um, is a Egyptian provi provider, and um, so there are um, um, 
currently there are other operators as well, which are local, um, but there are two different networks, which is the foreigner one and then the, the local one. And you could buy a SIM card to, um, to this. And the last time I bought it, it was uh, $250, which got you 50 um, megabytes of data. So um, you, you do not um, use it uh, too extensively. Yeah. It's worth noting that the price scheme for locals is totally different. Oh, cool. So they're not okay. paying 250 megs, but they also generally do not have external internet no. uh, on data. Um, um, I think pretty much any time, so, so I guess the other side of that is the, these phones, um, for a while they would sell them to you for money. Uh, and typically they would ask for 100 to 200 US dollars for a phone. Uh, I never saw a local actually paying that. Uh, the locals all would have vouchers, and it was going through the state distribution system for how a work unit would be allocated new cell phones. Um, so that price was for some very small, rich subset of the population that had access to hard currency. They could go around and not use the state distribution system and just like pay money, or foreigners they could try and milk some money out of. Um, but that was not where most of these cell phones were getting distributed. That was happening through this opaque rationing system. And there was, uh, what is the estimate? It used to be 3 million out of population of 23 million have a subscription, is it? They're up to seven or eight million. Up to seven, okay. Yeah, so it's quite a big. They have computers. Uh, we talked about Red Star a bit. Uh, Red Star 4 exists now. Um, I guess this is, I don't have a shot of it. Red Star 4 exists, it hasn't come out of the company. They sort of teased it on TV a couple times um, and, and showed logos of like, we've got this, but never took screenshots or like showed what it, the UI change or what's new in it. Um, and it's unclear if anyone has actually used it besides that they had an exhibition booth where they claimed that they had a version 4 now. Um, sorry. Uh, this is a Coriolink office, so this is where you go to register your cell phone, get it licensed, get SIM cards, get buy phones. Um, Coriolink is the Orascom subsidiary. Uh, it's actually divested from Orascom now. So Orascom, the original Egyptian owner, uh, has sold it off, and I believe it's now, there's like a Hong Kong-based subsidiary that still has an interest in it. Yeah. No, that's. Sorry, I'm getting these mixed up. So the other, the other side of this is the Wired Network, uh, which is Starco, and that was a joint venture initially with Loxley Pacific, uh, which is a Thai company, and that now Loxley Pacific has divested, and it's a Hong Kong guy that's the partner uh, for managing their wired connectivity out to China. Uh, software still gets installed physically in general, uh, so they have app stores which have lots of pictures of all the various video games, uh, or at like. I'm sorry that photo is blurry, but that's uh, one of the exhibition uh, halls, and you could go, and people had a little stall and would go take your phone and load apps onto it. Um, but that's that's how you get apps. And uh, one one word about the um, software or games. Um, uh, when having discussion, for example, when I showed that uh, when Angry Birds was really popular, I showed a, ber um, a version of, of Angry Birds in my home, um, in my phone, and the students were, yeah, yeah, of course we know the game. It's uh, developed by um, our country and it's called the Slingshot Birds. So um, that's, that's how um, games also found their way. They'll often, yeah. yeah. They'll often repackage them. Um, just take the APK, change some of the sprites, rebuild an APK and, and put that on phones instead. Um, we're in the midst of a transition uh, in some ways. Uh, most people have some watching of TV uh, that may be at their workplace, but like there is pretty high TV prevalence at this point, um, even in the countryside. A lot of that comes with weird DVRs that play weird formats of things and are mostly meant for like local TV broadcasts, um, but there are set-talk boxes that are pretty widely distributed. Some of those are running a Android or Linux-like system as well. Um, the companies and startups and, and technical efforts, um, a lot of what would have been direct ministry investments is turning into going through these corporate banking structures that have been set up, and that's more about you know someone else is getting the cut or they've got a different setup for how they're going to take that tax on profits. Um, in terms of how the country is interacting internationally, there's sort of three ways that you, or three different types of view that you can take. One is that they are uh, a consumer of technology, primarily from China. 
they also are a producer of technology. They, they will still contract when they can. Um, and then they are engaging and sort of taking whatever they can get for free uh, in terms of humanitarian, humanitarian and educational support. Um, as consumers, some of the Chinese brands, uh, GNE was a big media tech OEM Chinese cell phone distributor. They went bankrupt at the end of 2018. Um, and then the CEO of that uh, started a new company called Chenyi, also in Shenzhen, that I think also is now bankrupt. Um, but there was a period, like, for a while, all of the DPRK cell phones were basically rebranded g and &E products. And then in 2019, the new ones that came out were rebranded Chenyi products. So there's some relationship maybe between that CEO and DPRK. Uh, some of the tablets have been traced back to be the same hardware that uh, Huzu, a Chinese company, is selling. So... Um, you know, there, there's pretty reasonable evidence that uh, they're going out to these companies, mostly in Shenzhen, and getting the hardware made there, which is what, you know, any other country is doing as well. So that's not surprising. Um, and, and there's some collaboration in customizing the operating system based on the requirements of, of Pyongyang. Uh, as producers, um, they've got some websites that uh, are still up. Uh, Silver Star China got put on the sanction list uh, a year or two ago as like being a DPRK consulting company. Uh, the CEO is North Korean. It's like not particularly hiding. It's just was registered as a Chinese company. Um, they still run their website. They claim that uh, their app store feature is that they claim to have written a Fox News election 2016 app. So I think this gets more laughs in the US where we are worried about Russian interference. It's like, well, the North Koreans claim they made like our election apps. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why that one hasn't gotten much press. Um, and, and, and then they, they have other consulting things as well. I think uh, we have people in the audience who've, who uh, are more familiar with that than I am. Um, sanctions, so the, there have been sanctions for a while. There was another wave that got put in, in in 2017 or end of 2016. This is when U.S. citizens stopped being able to go. Uh, U.S. passports now... Uh, are not valid for travel, claims the U.S. State Department. So it's the U.S. State Department that gets me in trouble if I were to go, um, unless you go and ask for a one-time uh, passport that basically has this little stamp in it saying this is valid for one trip to DPRK that they sort of have only given journalists. Um, they started enforcements uh, this year, basically, as things went back to being not great. Um, right? There was a period of sort of bromance between Trump and, and Kim Jong-un, and that's starting to fall apart. Um, what, that had, what that sort of has meant is earlier this year, uh, the U.S. government started, uh, it, it had claimed that uh, people, foreign nationals who had traveled to North Korea wouldn't be valid for ESTA, uh, but hadn't been enforcing that until this year. So now, if you've traveled there, like if you've traveled to Iran, you have to apply for a full visa and you aren't valid for uh, an ESTA visa waiver. Um, and then uh, recently, uh, they uh, arrested uh, Virgil Griffith, uh, U.S. citizen, for traveling uh, to North Korea earlier this year. To uh, run a blockchain conference? He wasn't running it. He wasn't running it? The North no. Koreans were running it? No, oh, the okay. Korean Friendship Association, a tour company, was running it. A uh, blockchain conference. But it's, it's, yep. it's really just a, another level of sort of enforcement and causing fear and sort of trying to break down or uh, mess with that relationship. Um, Plenty of bad decisions in that one. Um, uh, a, big, a big list. Yep. Uh, and, and so one of the other things is that there is a lot of this contracting going through China that's just going to appear, uh, either it's a subcontract where the external company doesn't you know, actually even see that there is this subcontracting happening. Um, since most of the business is through China, like the opacity of that means that you may either be working with a North Korean company that's in Russia or China and not notice that, or it'll be a subcontract that you aren't even told about as a way that the Chinese company is saving costs. Uh, and then finally, education. Um, so Poost is still going. Uh, they're using third uh, country nationals, so no US citizens anymore, but they're still running uh, a working university. Um, there's other efforts. Chosun Exchange is based in Singapore. That takes North Koreans out to Singapore for week-long trainings in entrepreneurship. They've been running those, uh, and they've also had people go into the country and run workshops there. Um, it's seemingly a very successful program. Um, and then there, there's, I think, more engagement on that educational side than you would expect. There's a professor at UBC in Vancouver, Canada, that's been having um, 
North Korean academics come out to Canada five or six a year every year. That's that program's still going. Uh, she's been going in three or four times a year. Um, so there's you know there are people who are still able to walk this line of of living and working between North Korea uh, despite sanctions. So. Uh, uh, that, that line is growing thinner, uh, but it still is there. Um, in terms of technical capacity, um, the educational system, I think I've mentioned this, is, is really a traditional Asian educational system that places a lot of value on rote memorization, much less on creative thinking. That doesn't translate super well into programming. Um, so a lot of the computer science students that you're going to see who've gone through sort of the standard uh, educational process um, you know, can rewrite code samples very well, but uh, can't debug very well. Um, at, at one of the things that they do do is they will air gap access to the internet and access to the internal network. Uh, since the Pust campus has internet access, that means the students don't have access to the internal network, which is what they would normally have access to. Uh, and that means that they are normally, they're, they're mostly acting in a disconnected way while they're there. Uh, so they'll have access to a LAN, but they won't have external connectivity in general, uh, which is pretty limiting for them. Um, many of them express that they prefer being at Kim Il-sung or Kim Chek University where they would have intranet access um, because they can share files much more easily than, um, than they can here. Uh, yeah, so I think that's it. We I have a few more minutes for questions, hopefully. Um, we, but we seem to have uh, 15 minutes. So no, I, I don't know about that, but I think we have an angel who will help us, yeah? It was one hour, no? I, there was a sign that got popped up that said something okay. like five or ten minutes left. Okay. So I think okay. we may be getting um, close. Uh, anyway, so um, uh, we. But are there questions? Any yeah. questions? Uh, what kind of jobs do did those students of your get? What types of jobs did the students get? Ah, um, um, the actually, one of the most um, talented ones um, ended up as PhD students, and then it seems um, in academia, in local environment. So basically professors um, and in their system. And then um, some of the students ended up in the banking sector, which um, was also in the talk. Um, then uh, obviously, especially in the business, in the finance and management, is something that um, in theory is international trade. But of course there is not much trade happening at the moment. So, um, but we get very little information on that unless we see, we, of course, Pyongyang is in the end small place with the market, so you might pump up to students. Uh, on ECE, we, uh, some of the early graduate students did end up making it into KCC. Um, so, um, yeah. Hi, oh, I have a mic. I'm back here. Um, someone with the mic. I was just wondering, can you talk about how, uh, I would hear, curious to hear from both of you, how consumers in, in North Korea of technology learn about technology? Because like you, you talked about how they can go to these shops to get apps installed. Um, but like, is there advertising for things? And you know, through what medium do people learn what they want to get or what they need to get uh, on their phones, for example? Thank you. Um, excellent. Excellent question. Um, there are, um, I'm slicing this these to do in terms of advertising and in, in terms of the new knowledge. Um, uh, currently, uh, new knowledge is entering the country in a very increasing sp speed. Why is that? Is uh, because of the USBs and because of the awareness in general. If you ha if you ask directly, like, have you watched foreign movies? Um, it might be a um, taboo topic, as uh, one one discussions are not uh, possible in, in in the campus, for example. But everyone by default has consumed foreign media and even it's it's being monetized um, like you like information is is um, very valuable obviously if you have something it, it can be a trade-off um, then um, so it comes both it's it's not the information that is being parachuted it's that's probably not the most valuable info but um, the, that is coming through the markets and and those is one and then the notion on advertising <coughs> was um, that we often encounter discussions on that yeah, we don't need advertising in this type of country where it's the planning, plan, planned economy. Um, however, the discussion then changed when there were the first advertisements of local products in a, on a stadium, for example. And you could see um, on the way to the new Pyongyang airport that there were car advertisements. Um, the most default one was uh, rumors. So basically, 
So with, word of within, mouth. Yeah, word of within. Mouth, I'll, I'll go to you. Word of mouth is uh, an important thing, especially for things like consumer technology and, and phones that uh, you'll see your friends or whatever, someone gets a tablet and everyone wants one. Um, uh, the 2012 was the first consumer smartphone, the Ari Rong, um, and that allowed taking pictures and, and sending them to friends, and that was a big deal, right? That, that that was both a show of wealth and also this like new capability that people wanted to have. Uh, so there is a latent desire for this sort of stuff. Uh, you've also got you know, a, a core elite population that is able to travel to China and sees a lot of this technology just in common use in China and then uh, wants that as they come back into North Korea as well. There is a fair amount, they're really into like infomercials uh, so you can watch uh, the KCNA, the TV, and, and they upload a lot of it to YouTube, although YouTube keeps trying to take it down. But um, you can find sort of daily uploads from North Korea on YouTube of the current daily broadcast, and there's just a lot of infomercials about internal products that they want you to buy. Um, there's a lot of quack health science. Like, they'll, they'll sell everything as a health supplement, so there's a lot of that, but also sometimes you'll get advertisements for new tech products. There's a question over here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my question is on you briefly touched upon the ministries and like the role they they play in the whole thing in the IT infrastructure. Could you talk a bit more about like are they um, like competing with one another basically or yeah? How does this look yeah, like? Yeah, um, I can tell um, on my experiences like. It's, there is indeed a lot of competition between the ministries, those who obviously um, interact with foreign entities and, and then uh, um, a big power plays, those who are engaged with the special economic zones. And if you were in the edu education, like I was, um, uh, those went to specific um, uh, ministry as well. And you never knew what the map is. Like, and, and, and the decision making is done like that you, uh, it's it's very much in the darkness, but um, definitely a lot of competition on. I'm I'm not I don't know about tech. Or yeah, I mean, so you've got entities like KCC that are direct sort of. There, there's under a, a technology council. A lot of this falls under the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication as like the uh, entity that's setting uh, regulations and restrictions. But then you can have a company. Uh, or, or some part of another ministry, like the Ministry of Light Industry, uh, do an actual import of OEMs and work with KCC to do that. Um, so there's, there's some uh, both collaboration here of, uh, if you need technical services, you go to one of these approved labs um, because that sort of de-risks you and you want to lower your risk and liability of getting called out for messing up. Um, but, but you can still make money by doing the actual work of doing an import and selling a, round, a run of devices. Let's so, let's are we done? I don't see. Ah, uh, I a, see two <laughs> more hands over there. Okay. 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 Please say that you have questions before, oh. so I can run to you. Let's uh, finish after two questions, and yeah. Thank you. Um, the Otto Warm beer incident. The Otto Warmer incident. Oh, yes. Um, to to what degree did he provoke what happened, and did you feel threatened by it? Yeah. Uh, and then there's another question. What role play uh, Korean soaps who trickle in from China? Uh, uh, South Korean soaps. Okay, um, uh, the uh, discussion around Otto Bombier and then uh, on the South Korean uh, software, what role does it play? Well, um, on a couple of words on, on that particular case. Um, uh, to set the ground is that uh, obviously the host hostages and, and persons in North Korean prisons, um, it was all, always about nationalities of U.S. persons. And uh, that was like you were, in, you, you were in bigger danger than I would be as a Finn um, uh, if I would fool around, which leads to the, to the issue that um, if you are in North Korea and you are U.S. citizens and you go to a floor in a hotel that is a surveillance department, basically, and you steal a propaganda banner from there, um, that is um, quite a big offense to, to provoke in there. So that being said, what then happened is not justified by any, any means, but um, 
if you are a visitor in a country and you break the law, obviously some type of punishment will come, but it's, it's um, there a bit of provocation. But then how it was handled, of course, that's another, like, it, it was a horrible accident. And nobody knows what in the reality, what, what happened. What's your take on? Oh, do you have a take on that? Um, so, so I guess the thing that we heard is that the, there, there is sort of a culture of fear and lack of shared of responsibility. And one of the things that happened was during sort of the negotiations and release uh, with the US, the diplomats from North Korea didn't actually know of Otto's condition, that the hospital had sort of not told anyone about that. Uh, and so they thought they were releasing Otto in good condition, like up until the couple days before. Um, and, and so that sort of prompted uh, a different response from the US than might have happened if they had actually realized what was happening and had dealt with things in a cleaner way. Like part of that was uh, as a side effect of the internal culture, they messed up pretty badly politically in how they handled the situation. And then that led to a bunch of reverberations in terms of sanctions and outrage. Um, yeah. Uh, for South Korean dramas, I mean, I never saw any. I hear that that is more of a thing in, in two circumstances. One, there are people near the Chinese border, um, that that's a place where there's a more sort of crossover that pe some people have TV sets that can pick up Chinese TV. Um, and there's sort of just a, a, a bit of a black market that, that happens back and forth where that's a thing that people are walking back and forth or otherwise can get stuff physically. Um, in, North, in, in Pyongyang, that is going to be replaced by uh, privileged citizens who just sort of fly to Beijing and have a USB stick and are above the law. Um, and so it's still, it, it's, you know, uh, off limits enough that you're not going to see it, especially not as a foreigner. Um, no, but never. by all reports, it, it is happening. So um, for, for other movies that were like Disney or, or action movies or software that's not state approved, you would, that was a minimal enough infraction that you would see students with that stuff and they didn't care too much that you saw them with it. So that, that sort of is normalized to the point where it's not gonna get you in trouble that, that you are watching a Disney movie. Um, but uh, South Korean stuff I think was probably more sensitive that that wasn't something that I was gonna catch a student with. Um, you've been waiting for a while. Um, oh. I'm so sorry. But I think we Our are at the end. But uh, you... if it's quick. What kind of languages do the students uh, learn? Like English, yeah. of, of course, and what kind of programming languages do uh, they learn or yeah. can learn? Uh, so most Chinese. of them speak Chinese as a second language. Some speak Russian, um, some speak English. Uh, C. <laughs> cool, um, I think we're at the end, yeah. so thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you our host. <laughs> thank you, big thank you, big thanks.